distinguished uh, IALS speaker program, uh, giving an opportunity to our students and our faculty to interact with some of the best legal minds across the globe who have distinguished themselves in their respective fields. To start with this academic series, we have with us today Justice Richard Goldstone, former Justice of the South African Constitutional Court, to discuss on a very important topic, the current state of international criminal law and the necessity for an international anti-corruption court. It is due to the untiring and unwavering efforts of our director that it is possible to host such a series. Dr. Gurpur has been instrumental and has made tremendous contributions in the internationalization efforts at Symbiosis International Dean University, especially under the law schools that are under its banner. The international, uh, internationalization efforts include impressive number of international collaborations with universities across the world, students and faculty exchange, international projects like Eurasia 21st Century Teach Skills Project, DAD and Erasmus Grants, and membership with international bodies such as the IALS under whose aegis we are doing this uh, series, the International Association of Law Schools, the Asian Law Institute, the IUCN and the GAJE. In recognition of her contributions to the Indian Legal Academia, she was listed in the book 100 Legal Luminaries of India by LexisNexis. Dr. Gurpur has also been conferred with the prestigious annual Kittur Rani Chinnamma Award by the government of Karnataka in 2018 for her work towards the empowerment of women. I would like to now invite Dr. Gurpur to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Professor Lassia, and welcome uh, Justice Richard Gladstone. Uh, we have had the privilege of hosting an international judge for the first time delivering the webinar, Sir, you kickstart a new best practice in the challenges amidst many blocks posed by this global pandemic. Welcome to you, sir. And we also thank you, your gracious approach to us in terms of agreeing to deliver this lecture. First of all, uh, uh, you must be already familiar with Symbiosis International University and Symbiosis Law School Pune. Um, IALS has uh, been our great supporter. We have been the members of IALS uh, since 2007. Ever since uh, Dr. Frank took over the leadership, we have had a lot of innovation, which includes uh, having a judges collective as part of the IALS uh, think tank. So uh, we have had many judges who had enriched our own uh, global audience meet which we hosted for the IALS in 2017. In that meet, uh, we had the privilege of creating a dialogue between judges in terms of enhancing the legal education uh, quality. Uh, one of the ways was to see that judges engage in academic process of the institutes and also engage as mentors for the prospective lawyers as well as prospective judges. So, sir, your presence is going to be very, very valuable from both these perspectives. In addition to symbiosis passion and DNA of internationalization of higher education for promoting international understanding through quality education. Sir, uh, our law school was created in 1977 as the first standard higher education institution under the symbiosis banner. Symbiosis was founded by a botany professor with a philanthropic uh, and uh, generous outlook to support the African students in Pune in the 70s when they were alienated due to the post-colonial climate that we had. So our law school was the second one in the landscape of Pune in 1977. And today we have more than 19 law schools in Pune itself. And India has about 1,215 law schools in various hues and shades affiliated to the universities, law universities. And we also have law schools like us, which are constituents of, a, uh, of an autonomous university. So uh, if you look at the website of Symbiosis Law School Pune, you would agree with me that this law school has been on the forefront of 
legal education uh, uh, reform movement. In our country, we have had great legal educationists like Professor Bakshi, Professor Menon, who have uh, uh, kickstarted the idea of bringing legal education at par with other professional education like medical education. So some of the reforms which were introduced were a fully fledged five year law program, which was started in mid 80s. And Symbiosis Law School Pune was the pioneer among three or four other law schools across India to start this program. Till then, we had graduates entering the law program as a short part time program. So fire law course itself was introduced to bring that professionalism and fully oriented serious law program and not law as a side degree to get promotion or an additional degree on the CV. So fire law program in Symbiosis Law School is also a kind of innovation because we were the first law school among two others to introduce a very unique BBA LLB program where the students get an integrated law degree with management and business expertise alongside the law. Till then in India, humanities or social sciences and law combination was the only one prevailing. Today we have these programs elevated to BBA LLB honors program and BLLB honors program, sir. Aside from that, we have got our postgraduate program, one year program in which we bring in both these programs. We bring a lot of international content, international teachers, international best practices and our own teachers take these best practices abroad through our various projects and uh, exchange programs. Our students have the option of spending a semester abroad, bringing their grades here. So we have uh, altogether about 2000 students out of which uh, a large majority about 1700 belong to this undergraduate program. Another 100 belong to a postgraduate program with the eight specializations. This year we are introducing uh, European Union legal studies as a specialization. And then uh, we have the PhD program where we already have had about 20 PhD graduates and we are having a, a, a strength of about 50 plus PhD students pursuing PhD with us. I must also share with you, sir, we have had very strong relationship with South African universities. Two law schools have been on board and uh, we have had uh, a law professor Radley uh, coming here for uh, uh, I mean on a visit uh, once and then uh, he has been in touch developing research papers developing curriculum. We are looking at African legal studies as well. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you that when South African constitution was being formulated, uh, India was recommended as the country to be engaging in uh, drafting this constitution. And I have had the privilege of studying in a law school, uh, sorry, it, working in a law school, uh, which was closely engaged with this, the National Law School of Bangalore. So uh, we recently recalled uh, the way in which uh, the South African constitution has been an innovative constitution, taking seriously a lot of areas which we should have uh, taken more seriously in the post-colonial, post-independence era. Uh, for example, right to water uh, or uh, right to family. So some of these dimensions were discussed recently. So we are looking at, sir, uh, going ahead, a uh, kind of uh, mooting competition on comparative constitution where we would like to bring on board judges like you to formulate the problem to judge the cases. So, sir, I'm sure that uh, your uh, learned exposition today, particularly in the area of anti-corruption, is going to be very, very pertinent to our country. Uh, you would agree that uh, post-colonial countries have had very high rank in terms of uh, perception index about corruption, and India is no exception. And in India, anti-corruption laws have been uh, created, but they have been weakened also by procedures, etc. Uh, and uh, I, I really admire the fact that you picked on a topic of transnational dimension. Uh, now that is a dimension which is bogging us down these days. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that your learned exposition alongside the live cases that you would have dealt with and the reforms you would have engaged with as a jurist would definitely give richer insights to our students. Once again, I welcome you on behalf of our management, on behalf of our faculty, our vice chancellor, pro chancellor and chancellor, on behalf of our students. 
Um, and I also register here that uh, uh, the IALS is to be uh, indebted to here for bringing this very, very rich quality input to our quality legal education drive. Uh, welcome once again, sir, and uh, I look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the welcome address. Um, our speaker today is uh, Justice Richard Goldstone, the former justice of uh, South African Constitutional Court uh, in South Africa. Uh, he was um, uh, the judge in South Africa for 23 years and the last nine years as a justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Since retiring from the bench, he has taught as a visiting professor in a number of uh, United States and European law schools. From August 1994 to September 1996, he was the chief prosecutor of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal from the for, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. He's an honorary member of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York and a foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's an honorary bencher of the Inner Temple London. He's the honorary president of the Human Rights Institute and the International Bar Association. The awards he has received include the International Human Rights Award of the American Bar Association in 1994 and the International Justice Award of John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation in December 2009. We are very honored to have you on board with us, sir, and uh, to learn from you as you deliver your lecture today. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Gopur, for your, for your warm welcome. Uh, I, I'm delighted to have been able to accept the invitation from your law school and particularly in my capacity as a member of the Judicial Council of the International Association of Law Schools. I speak to you from a quite cold Johannesburg in South Africa. Unfortunately, Johannesburg is sharing with you in Pune the, the, the huge onslaught from the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic. So, so we're very much in the same, in, the, in, in similar positions at the moment. But I suppose we should be very grateful to, to modern technology that we, are, that we are still able, speaking from our homes to people in our homes. And I'm very happy that there's so many students uh, who, who are listening uh, to, to this uh, 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 webinar uh, that, that we are able to, 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 to do this, as I say, across continents and across oceans. Uh, it's an auspicious day for this, uh, for, for us to consider international criminal law, particularly because today is the World Day for International Justice. And I will come back to that in a moment. I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to have to do it uh, f f fairly succinctly and, and, and economically because of the amount of material, but I hope you will bear with me. Uh, a little bit of history, first of all. Before the Nuremberg trials in 1945 of the Nazi leaders after the Second World War, the, the four victorious nations put the Nazi leaders on trial. This had never been done before and they needed a law to do this. There, there was no real international criminal law in those days. The law of wars applied to governments and, and, and didn't include uh, criminality for individuals. But at Nuremberg, they, they were inventive and, uh, and, and the Nazi leaders were charged and found guilty of crimes of aggression, of war crimes, and a new concept, crimes against humanity. Then the next development was really in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, uh, which recognized for the first time what are called the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. These for the first time created criminal, criminal responsibility by individual soldiers and leaders, military leaders, political leaders for, for, for uh, uh, serious uh, contraventions of the Geneva Conventions. The success of the Nuremberg Tribunal really began a movement to uh, create a permanent international criminal court. If one looks at the Genocide Convention of 1948, uh, one, one sees there that there was a reference to a court of, to, to an international criminal court created by treaty. But unfortunately, nothing happened for nearly 50 years. In particular, the Cold War intervened 
and 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 international the international criminal court was put onto a back burner but it was the terrible crimes that were committed in the in the in the first half of the 1990s firstly in the former yugoslavia where huge war crimes and genocide were committed and then in 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 1994 the the genocide in in rwanda in west africa where almost a billion people uh, were, were 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 murdered uh, for, for 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 really racial and ethnic and ethnic reasons and in the face of those uh, 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 war crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the Security Council of the United Nations, using its peremptory powers, created two new international instruments. One was the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and the second was the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. It was my privilege and very difficult job uh, to be the first prosecutors uh, the, the, to be the first prosecutor for both of those tribunals. They were successful in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in bringing the leaders of armies and paramilitary groups responsible for the terrible war crime to trial in The Hague. Uh, some hundreds were, were, were put on trial and many of them are now serving long prison sentences in Europe and in Africa. The successes in turn of those two tribunals led to so-called hybrid or mixed tribunals being, being established in Sierra Leone, in Cambodia, in Kosovo and in Lebanon. Then in the middle of 1998, to, to the surprise of most international lawyers, uh, over 140 nations gathered uh, in, uh, in, in Rome and decided to establish a permanent international criminal court, the ICC. 120 nations voted in favor of what is called the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute is really the constitution that governs the international criminal court. And it's, it's made up of an assembly of states parties uh, to which every member state that's ratified the Rome Statute uh, is, is a party. Today, there are 123 members of the Assembly of States parties. It is the governing body of the ICC, of the International Criminal Court, and it elects the, the, the judges and the, the prosecutor. Now, importantly, the, the ICC is founded on the principle of complementarity, and I'll come back to that in the context later of an international anti-corruption court. The, the, the system of complementarity means that the international court is a court of last resort. It has no jurisdiction at all if the country where the criminals uh, live, uh, the, the, the governments of, of, of their countries, if those countries decide themselves to investigate and put on trial uh, alleged uh, uh, war criminals, then the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction. So any, any, any country can keep away the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court by investigating its own suspected and alleged war criminals. Um, there are two ways in which people can come before the court, uh, the International Criminal Court. The one is obviously if crimes are committed within a nation that is a member of the International Criminal Court, the court will have jurisdiction. What's more controversial, but not unusual, is that the court also has jurisdiction over war crimes committed by, by, by people who are members, who are national citizens of countries that have joined the International Criminal Court. So to give you, to give you a hypothetical example, uh, if, if an Indian national commits a war crime in my country, South Africa, there, there will be jurisdiction in the International Criminal Court because South Africa is a member. If, if a South African, if, if an Indian citizen commits a war crime in China, the court will have no jurisdiction because neither India nor China is a member of the International Criminal Court. So that, that is the way the, the system 
of complementarity works. The ICC has been in operation now for 18 years. They've been a difficult 18 years, and the main difficulty, and it was one we faced also in the UN, in the United Nations tribunals, the difficulty is that the International Court does not have any means of enforcing its orders or, or of ensuring that its requests to governments are, are, are respected and carried out. No international court, no international body has its own army, its own police, and therefore it's completely reliant on cooperation from governments if it is to succeed. It can't get people arrested itself. It has to rely on governments to undertake, uh, to undertake arrests. The, the courts had difficult years. There have been complaints about, its, about its, its, the, the cases it's chosen. There have been complaints about its efficiency. And I am at the moment chairing uh, an independent uh, expert review group that was set up uh, at the beginning of this year by the Assembly of States parties. There are nine experts from nine different countries around the world. And our job is, is to try and find ways to strengthen the International Criminal Court and to strengthen the Rome Statute system. And we hard at work and our final report will be submitted by the end of September of this year. Now, we, we must take into account that, that one of the other problems faced by the International Criminal Court and by many international organizations, is that large and powerful countries don't like being judged by international courts, by international committees. And it's for that reason, I would suggest, that the four largest, the four most populous countries in the world are not members of the ICC. I refer, I refer of course, to, to China, to your own country, India, to the United States of America and, and to Russia. They don't see it as being in their interest to, be, to, be, to, sub, to, to submit themselves even remotely to the jurisdiction of an international court. And that's a problem. And the, the, only, the only hope is that if the International Criminal Court does act uh, efficiently and does act successfully, some of these larger countries uh, some of these populous countries may may change their policy and become and become members. We are faced too today with, with an added difficulty with regard to international organisations, and that is nationalism, populism, uh, autocracy, and countries wanting to do their own thing. And of course, this is being led at the moment by the present administration in the United States. Uh, which puts its own interests above those of the people of all other countries. One understands that, but it's not the way we can have a peaceful and successful world if, if countries don't cooperate with each other, and particularly in the days of the COVID pandemic, uh, where, where we are one world. Uh, the, the, the COVID virus doesn't, doesn't recognize and doesn't understand national borders and crosses oceans uh, without any difficulty. The largest number of countries who have joined the ICC uh, come from Africa. And I'm happy to say too that all the members of the European Union have also joined the ICC. As I mentioned, there are 123 nations who have done so. Um, the latest case before the ICC began only two days ago in The Hague. It's against one of the uh, le leaders of an Al-Qaeda group um, uh, in, 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 in Mali, in West Africa, that, uh, who is accused of having committed many serious crimes, including rape and sexual slavery, and also being responsible for, for, for religious reasons for destroying the amazing shrines and statues and buildings in the city of Timbuktu in Mali. So that is, that is a general, general background to the, to the International Criminal Court. Uh, it's, it's, it's got judges, 18 judges from, from 18 different countries. It's got a staff of about 380 people. It's housed in a, in a lovely building 
uh, just outside the centre of The Hague uh, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. It's been obviously suffering too by the, uh, by the pandemic. It's, it's, it's having its court cases. I mentioned one started this week. It's being done remotely. The, the accused is, is listening to the, it, he has to listen uh, from, uh, from his prison cell in The Hague and the judges uh, are involved remotely uh, with the trial. This is a problem, obviously, that's facing, facing not only international courts, but also courts in your country and my own country.